with our lesson. We continue tonight. We're going to be in the latter part of Romans chapter 12. And uh, up until this point, we've gone through the whole book of Romans, from chapter 1 all the way now to chapter 12. And we've been talking about the Roman-American way, about how what Rome was doing and the path that took Rome down is the same path that America is on. That America has the same problems, the same issues. And it's because sin does the same thing to every nation. Sin is the same world round. When sin gets involved and sin gets in the heart and to the character of mankind, it destroys. It destroys everything that it touches. And thankfully, in the book of Romans, we get the answer. We've been talking about that. What is the answer? The same answer now, or excuse me, same answer that was back then is the same answer now, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the answer. So if we take what is written to the Romans and apply it to our own life, and we understand how it affects us, then we can in turn help keep America going. Because I think that's the responsibility of the church now. Because we know that the United States has become wicked. We know that sin is everywhere. And believe you me, I, I, I love being American. I wouldn't want to be anything else. I'm very patriotic. I love my country. But in the same right, as a Christian, I see the mistakes our country is making. I see where sin is a lot, is becoming more brazen, it's becoming more bold, it's becoming more front page news instead of back page news. It's all over the place. And what is the agent that fights that? That's, it's the church. It's Christ in us. It's us doing what we're supposed to do, keeping on the firing line, going out there, witnessing, being the light of the world. And we talked about this. And, and previous, in chapter 12, we talked about how Paul begins to transition away from theology into being practical. And up until that point, we went through a spell where the theological debate was the law and grace. Law and grace. And we talked about how the law came up short. The law couldn't redeem us. The law couldn't wash away our sins. The law could just show us our sins. But Jesus came bringing grace. And now we can have a removal of our sins through the hand of God, through Jesus Christ, through His grace. And Paul brought home the point that this grace, you don't do anything to earn it. You don't do anything to work for it. It's freely given. Amen? It's freely given to us. So therefore, because we have this grace freely given, and the only thing it takes to become saved is to believe in Christ, confess that He is the Savior, confess that He is everything the Word says He is, and you'll be saved. That's what the Bible says. But from that point on, this is where Romans chapter 12 through the, the ending of the book really begins to show us how we honor grace. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, just like we did last Wednesday, of what are the steps we do to honor this grace that we're given? What do we do to honor the relationship that's freely given from the Father? Well, we talked about last week about how in Romans chapter 12, in the beginning of it, he says to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We talked about that, and that's the blueprint of how we honor grace. We didn't do anything to deserve salvation. It was freely given. It was freely purchased for us by Jesus. He invites everyone to come in and stand in it. Well, we've accepted that. We're standing in it right now. But what does God expect from us? Does God expect from us to get in this grace and then continue in our sin? No. God forbid. What God expects us to do is honor that relationship just like we would honor a relationship with our wife. I always bring up the, the husband-wife relationship because the Bible talks about how we are the bride of Christ, the church. We are the bride of Christ, and we have to look at our relationship with Him in that nature. Just the same way as, as when I came down the aisle and we got married, me and Heather, I have an obligation to honor that commitment. And by honoring that commitment, there are certain actions I take to honor that commitment. Amen? Because, let's, let's just look at it for this way. If Let's say that, you know, Heather's working. She goes to work. I have to run to the store. I go to the store, and for some crazy, unknown reason, let's say some lady starts hitting on me. What, did I, what do I do? I have a choice. I can either honor my commitment to my wife, or I can flirt back, I can start being flirtatious, I can see how far this will take me, and therefore if I've done that, then I've broken my commitment to my wife. I've broken it. 
And no matter how many times I would try to spin it or try to, to whitewash it, the minute I came home and if, if I was being honest with Heather and I said, hey, you know what? This lady started flirting with me. I gave her my number. We're going to go out on a date next week. How do you think that would fly with her? Exactly. She would be livid. And rightfully so. She was like, you did what? What? Why? Because I dishonored the commitment that I made to her. That's the way we have to look at grace. When we step into grace, we are committed to Jesus Christ. We're committed to God the Father. The way we honor that is when the devil comes tempting. And the devil comes flirting. And the devil says, hey, here, you need to get involved in this. You need to go over here. You need to do this. The Bible even mentions it in those terms when it says, do not be fornicators with the world. Don't fornicate with sin. We have to be on our toes and do certain actions and take certain actions that don't save us. The actions we take don't redeem us. Jesus redeemed us. The actions we take honor the relationship that we have with Jesus. We honor them just like we would honor our wives or our husbands. For you wives out there, the, that's the way we would honor. We would say, you know what? I can't do this. I can't go the way you're wanting me to go because I'm committed to Jesus Christ. I can't be a part of that because that would dishonor my Lord. So I have to stay here. So from chapter 12 on, we, Paul begins to break down and tell us these are the ways we honor grace. This is the way we honor our relationship with God. And it's about having a sacrificial heart. It's about having a life that we lay down for the Lord and we say, Lord, my life is yours. I put it in your hands. You dictate to me what I do. That's why he's called the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Many people like Jesus to be their savior. Save me from hell. Save me from all the bad stuff. Save me from my sickness. Save me from aches and pains. Save me from headaches. But then when Jesus steps in, okay, I'll be your savior, but you have to do what I say. Then they're like, wait, wait, wait. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to live my life. You can't have it that way. Jesus has to be savior and Lord. That's why the Bible calls him that. Amen. So when he's Lord, we lay down. So let's pick up where we left off last time. And... We're going to, uh, I'm going to read a little bit from where we did uh, leave off. I'm going to start in verse 14. Verse 14, he says, we talked about this briefly at the end of last week. He said, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Now, we talked about this briefly last week about how as Christians, because we've been living in this grace and it's freely given, Jesus is overwhelmingly forgiving to us. He's overwhelmingly understanding. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. That's the way God treats us. Therefore, that's the way God expects us to honor this relationship we have. Freely you've, given, freely you've been given, or excuse me, freely you've received, freely give. What that means to us is as Christian people, the way we honor the grace we live in is when we have somebody who's difficult, an enemy, a foe, somebody who's out there to, to just push our buttons every day. And believe you me, we've all got them. We've all got people who, are, who push us and know how to, how to really push us to the edge and push every button we got. And if we were being honest with ourselves, we'd be like, you know what? That is my enemy. They are my enemy. They're the ones that I don't want to see in the hallway. They're the ones I don't want to see coming because they're my enemy. Well, God says you cannot treat them as an enemy. Because at one time, to understand this, the Bible says to be friends with the world is to be at enmity with God or an enemy of God. At one time when we were in our sins, we were the enemy of God. But yet God showed us overwhelming love through Christ and he saved us. That's the way God wants us to portray this, this relationship. That's why we honor grace is we pray for our enemies. And he goes on to even say that. In verse 20, he's in, he says, Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. 
Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. When's the last time, and, and, I, and I hope by now I've spurred somebody's image or somebody's name in your brain, that you're like, man, that's the person. If I had one, that's them. I hope I've spurred them. When's the last time you took them out to eat? And said, hey, come on, I want to buy you lunch. What? I'm not buying that guy lunch. I'm not buying her lunch, man. The way she talks about me, the way they, what they've done to me, there ain't no way. That's what the Bible says. To put it in terms we understand, when he says, you know what, if they're hungry, feed them. Take them out to eat. Take them out. It's hard to maintain grudge and fighting when it's just you and them and you're on one side of the table and they're on the other and you're there and you're eating. It's hard to maintain that. Some things have to come down. Walls have to come down. Even if it's just polite niceties that come to the surface, something has to give. Why does God want us to do that? Because that's exactly what he does to all of mankind. The enemies, the, the, the sin that we've committed that sent Jesus Christ to the tree, the sins that of all mankind that, that were against God and betrayed God and, and literally spit in God's face, he turns around and invites them to sup with him. He invites them. He says, he says, I stand at the door and knock. He said, anybody who will open up, he said, I will come into him and I will sup with him. He said, I will eat with him. I will share bread with him. Why? Because he loves us so much. And the reason why we love him is because that love changed us. Think about the day you were saved. Think about the day when you really turned your life over to God. It wasn't a bunch of rules that turned you that way. It wasn't, it wasn't a denomination. It wasn't anything like that. What turned you that way was the love of God hit you. And for the first time, you realized how much he loves you. You realized how much he touched you, how much he did for you. But when, when you didn't even know him, he, he was working on your behalf. That's what moved you. That's what melted your heart and heart. That's what made you surrender to God and give him everything you got. If God, if, and, and we got to understand, God is the master of everything, and he sets the pattern that we should follow. If you want to see people saved, it's the old adage we always heard before, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. It doesn't matter how much Bible you know. It doesn't matter how much uh, gospel you can spew at them. It doesn't matter how many three-point sermons you can throw in their face. Unless they know you care for them, it's not going to get to them. When you begin to love people, love enemies, love people that sometimes make themselves very hard to love, when we begin to love like that, that's the purest form of the love of God that we're ever going to see. That's we're ever going to taste. Because that's exactly what God did for us. We were unlovable, but he loved us still. Amen? We were sinners, and he loved us still. Amen? The Bible even says that God commended his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? He died for me when I was the biggest point of my sin. He still loved me enough to die for me. He didn't wait till I got good and then said, oh, okay, I'll die for him now. No, he died for us when we were in the depths of our sin. And he died. So, and we even talked about a little bit last week about revenge. <laughs> that revenge isn't ours. That revenge is the Lord's. And that I don't have to get back. I don't have to make even. You know, if, if someone's talking about me, if Isaac is back there and he's saying, I hate this preacher and he's fat and he's ugly and, and I don't like him and, and I don't like all this stuff. I don't need to jump up and be like, well, who is Isaac? Let me tell you a little something about Isaac. No, I don't need to do that. Because when I do that, I dishonor the grace of God. I dishonor what's been freely given to me. Forgiveness. I dishonor it. How is that? Because how many times have we went against God, but God has covered it over with love, compassion, blood of Jesus Christ, wiped our sins away. I don't have to worry about getting even. And the reason why I don't have to is I can say, well, you know what, I'm not going to let that get to me. And I'm just going to keep going on and doing my life and doing what I do because I know God loves me. And I'm going to keep sending love to Isaac, even if he doesn't return it. Because I know at the end, it's not up to me to get back. It's not up to me. It's up to God. God will even the score if I just leave it in his hands. He'll leave it. That's what the Bible says. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Meaning... If we go the separate ways and, and 
And Isaac keeps on spreading all kinds of craziness about me. But I just keep on loving Isaac. When it's time to be judged for the things that we've done, I'm going to come out on the good. But Isaac is going to face a different one. So see, that's why we honor the grace of God. Now, will doing that purchase my salvation? No. But it honors the grace in which we stand. So that's what he's talking about. Let's continue. He says in verse 21, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. This is something that's very hard for us because doing evil comes natural. We have a sinful nature. <laughs> doing evil things comes natural to us. Nobody has to be taught how to be a sinner. Nobody. Just like I said, when you're raising your kids, that first little baby boy or baby girl you had, so innocent, you know, just, you know, you're, you're loving every minute that they do. The first time they get in trouble, the first time you're like, did you do that? No. Who taught them that? Who taught them? No parent sits down with their kids and says, okay, now when you get in a tight spot, why? How's it come out of them? It's their nature. It's the nature of man. The sinful nature. It's born into us. It's bred into us. It's there from the beginning. We can blame Adam for that. But understand, it's there. But we now have the nature of Christ. And that's what we have to tap into when evil is being done towards us. The way we conquer it is the way Christ conquered evil. With good. And we've got to do good. And whatever that means to do good. Even, even the Bible tells us to not be weary in doing good. To constantly do good towards others. Because in the end, it will pay off. We don't know what the good we do today is going to have an effect on someone down the road. We may not see it the very next day. We may not see it within a year. But somewhere along the line, that gives God something to say, you know what? Some, somebody was good to you. Somebody showed you the love of Christ. And you never know. It could reap their soul. Now, he gets into Romans chapter 13. And we're going to get into some stuff again that is, is a little bit difficult. But it's something that God asks us to do. In verse 1 of chapter 13, he says this. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. Nobody likes that word submit. For all authority comes from God. And those in, in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right. But in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Now, we're, di we're, we're going to dive into some things here that are, are not popular a lot with modern day Christianity. Why? Why? Because everybody has their opinion on the president, right? I could ask you, and you could probably write me a book of what you think of Mr. Obama, right? But guess what? You know who put Obama there? God. God. Oh, no, no, it was the devil. He manipulated it. No. Read your Bible. It is God who lifts up, and it is God who takes down. Now, why did God lift him up there? We can debate about that. Could it be because we're being punished? For the way we've been acting as a nation? Could be. Amen. I don't want to get political. Amen. I don't want to get political tonight. But I want to tell you that as Christians, what this is getting down to, if I could kind of whittle it down to the bare bones of what he's saying here, what he's saying is Christians should be the best ideal citizens in the world. In the world. Why? Because we hold ourselves to a divine standard, not just a natural standard. We hold ourselves... With the love and honor of God. And we honor the authority that God has put in place. Here's another quick thing of how you deal with authority. How many times, now this is kind of a funny one, but how many times have you been driving and all of a sudden there's a cop beside you? And you know you've not done anything wrong. You know everything's legal. You know everything's right. You know everything. But immediately you're like, oh, 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 be still. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. We don't want him to see us move. We, we don't want him to look over here at all. Why is that? Because we have a fear of authority. 
We have a fear of that. Why? Because we know if the cop sees something, he can get out and say, I'm going to write you a ticket, and here you go. You're in the wrong. But why do we have that symbol? Because, and, and even he addresses this talking to the people. He says, guys, if you're being the people you're supposed to be, you shouldn't be afraid of authorities. I don't want my kids being afraid of cops. They're not the bad guy. Amen? But how many times has our kids seen a cop and we're like, Oh, mommy, there's the cops, there's the police. What do I do? What do I do? Where did they learn that from? From us. They learned it from us. If cops are the bad guys of your world, you're not where you need to be in God. Amen? Cops are the good guys. They're here to help us. They all, oh, some of them corrupt. Sure, I understand that. But understand, as the whole, the reason why they're in place, the reason why we have them there, is to keep order and to keep people obeying the law. Amen? And Christians shouldn't be the ones that are trying to get away with stuff. We should keep the law. Do you know that's in your Bible? To obey the laws of the land. We have laws. We have speed limits. We have laws. We have things that we know are right and we know that are wrong. And every one of us has been guilty of seeing that speed limit and saying, you know what, I'm going 10 miles above it because I've got to go. Every one of us has. But understand, when you do that, you know what that makes? That makes you fearful of every cop and every car that looks like a cop car coming your way. Oh, was that a cop? Was that a cop? Oh, they're slow down. Pump the brake. Why? Because you're doing something wrong. Amen? Amen. Come on, guys. You know I'm, I'm telling you the truth tonight. You know I'm telling you the truth. If you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have anything to fear. If you're doing the speed limit, zoop, I ain't got anything to worry about. Right? But if you're going 15 over, ugh, you're just praying. That's not a good time to pray <laughs> when you're breaking the law. <laughs> God's not going to hear that prayer. He's going to be like, no, you should not be doing this. Okay, now I understand I'm putting out very light, but it gets the point across. We are to be ideal citizens. We are to be ideal workers. You ought to be the best employee at wherever you work. You ought to shine. Why? Because you have God. And you have Jesus. And the Bible says, do everything you do as unto the Lord. Amen. So that means when you're out there and you're doing your job, you're not doing it for the boss you hate. You're not doing it for the company you hate. You're not doing it even for the measly paycheck you get at the end. You are doing it for your Lord. You're doing it for your King. So therefore, it lifts your standard to a place of excellence. Amen? That's what it should. So the Bible tells us these are things that we do to honor the grace that we have. We have, we have we're, okay, let's go on to verse 6. Another one that hopefully everyone's doing. Pay your taxes. Amen? <laughs> Two. For these same reasons, for government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Again, getting to keeping the law. Jesus even said it this way. Render unto Caesars what is Caesars. Do you know why they get your money? It's because they're on your money. Amen? Read your money. It's on there. The federal government, it's on there. That's why they have a right to it. It's theirs. Just like it was in the Romans day when Caesar, he said, hey, we're in they tried to get Christ. They said, hey, now he's on our side. He's a person of the people. Do we have to pay taxes? Jesus said, yes, you do. Why? Because his face is on the coin. All right? He said, give to him what's his. Give to, to the Lord what's his. We've got to understand that, and I don't want to get into tax debating and Tax fraud. Hopefully, no one is committing tax fraud. If you are, you need to repent. Amen. You need to repent. <laughs> and lying is lying. Uh, however, you do it. So understand that, that we're, we're. I'm not trying to cover all of that tonight. You should know that by now. But understand that the things that we do, we should be very honest with and upfront with. As Christians, we should not be conniving. And under the table in anything we do. It's not something that honors the grace of God. God is not shady. God does not do things under the table. God is very honest, transparent, and knows. Because everything he does is good and praiseworthy. 
Amen? It's the same way we should be. Because he even goes on to here, he says that, that you, when you talk about pay your taxes, he says for the government workers need to be paid for the servant, for their serving God and what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Everyone. Anybody got credit card debt? Anybody pay the light bill? Pay the gas? Give them what you owe them. Amen. This is why. Hey, you're not going to go to hell if you got a credit card. But understand, if you get a credit card, max it out, and you don't intend paying it, and you tear it up, and whatever, you're stealing, and it's wrong. Amen? If you get a light, if you get a house, and you got the light bill, and it's in your name, and it comes up past due, and you go and get it in your baby's name, that's fraud, and that's lying, and it's wrong. Amen? Anything we do like that is wrong. And what God is telling us here is that a lot of times we don't think these part of things factor into our religious life, but they do. They do, because it reveals our character. And our character should be touched by God. Our character should be as such that when people see us, they see the Lord in us. Amen? And they see what He does. Even the Lord paid taxes. It's in the Bible. Because Peter was worried about it. And he's like, what are we going to do? They asked Peter, and they, they said... Does your master not pay taxes? And Peter opened his mouth like he always did. He's like, oh, yeah, we pay taxes. Didn't have a clue where he's getting it. But then he goes back to the Lord and he says, hey, they want us to pay taxes. And that's when the Lord said, hey, go fishing. Go down there. First thing you catch, look in its mouth. And there was, boom, money. So even the Lord paid his taxes. So understand, we have to be someone that doesn't do anything shady. Let's keep going. He says in verse 8, owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. Wow. Wow. Just imagine how great the world would be if everyone lived by just that little rule. Owe, no, no, owe nobody nothing except to love them. That's all you owe anybody, is to love them. You don't owe them, like we said before, to get them back. I owe you one. No, you don't. <laughs> what you owe one another is to love one another. That's it. That's it. And in turn, to preach the other side of that coin, in turn, that's all we should want from one another. is to be loved by one another. We shouldn't be users and abusers of one another. We shouldn't be cons of one another. We shouldn't, uh, in, in, in the church or in the world, we should, any way we want to put it, towards sinners or towards saints, we should be somebody who wants to love people and just wants people to love us because that's what God wants us to do. Amen? Amen. He says, he says, it's your obligation to love one another. I mean, verse 8, if you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of God's law. Jesus said this as well. They asked Jesus, which is the greatest of all the commandments? Jesus said to love the Lord your God with everything you've got and to love your neighbor as yourself. He said all the prophets and all the law hang on these two. That means what's holding them up for all mankind to read, to say that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Everything can be overcome if we simply love God and love each other. I won't steal from you if I love you. Amen? Amen. You won't steal from me. If you love me. Amen. I won't try and take your wife because I love you. You won't try to take my wife because you love me. We have love and honor for one another. Because we love one another, it cancels out all of the sin. I won't talk bad about you because I love you. You won't talk bad about me because we love you. Because you love me. That's the way God is putting this. All of the sin that's in the world can be resisted and can be overcome if we will love God. And love people. It's that simple. Simple. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Not do unto others what they have done unto you. That's not the golden rule. Amen. Everybody wants to quote that and then go eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Guess what? That's the law. God, Jesus fulfilled the law. We don't live eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth anymore. I just read it to you. What we live is they do evil unto me, I do good unto them. They show me hate, I show them love. They show me ill will, I show them kindness. 
Why? Because that's what God wants. That's the grace of God that he wants towards us. Okay, let's keep on going. He says in verse 11, This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than we have first believed. The night is almost gone, and the day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty cloths, and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living and in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Right there, he covers a lot of what the world is pushing. Let's look at it here. What is the world's biggest thing? What does the world want to do? What is the world's idea of fun? Wild parties, getting drunk, having sex, doing what you want to do. If someone gets in your way, hey, forget them. Climb on whoever you want to climb on. Just get to the top, baby, because that's where you need to be. That's the world. That's the world. That's exactly what he summed up in Rome thousands of years ago. He said, you know what? This is happening in Rome. It's happening in America. There's nothing new under the sun, gang. I know it seems like we're coming up with something new every day. They didn't have laptops back then. They didn't have that. But guess what? They still had the same sin going on that they do, we do now. And it was the way of the world, and the way of the world has not changed. And the Bible tells us, guess what? All those things, and I love the way the Bible puts it. He says, all those things, those dirty deeds. You ever heard that song, Dirty Deeds, and they're done dirt cheap? I remember that from a sinful days. Those dirty deeds. He says, you've got to take all of them and take them off like they are filthy clothes and throw them away and put on the clothes of righteousness. Amen. But the problem with the church today is we keep a little bit of party clothes in the back of the closet just to break out every now and again. And we shouldn't. We shouldn't. Because if we cannot get to the place to where... God's grace is sufficient enough to remove our sins and to hold us in righteousness, then what hope does it give a world that's looking for salvation? If you and I can't do it, how do we expect them to do it who do not know Jesus? How do we expect people that we witness to to say, hey, you need to come out from your sin. We need to come out from the sin. But when they look at us and they say, oh, but you're still in that sin. Why, why are you still in that sin? Oh, well, God's still working on me. But he really needs to work on you. Come on, gang. Come on. I'm being honest with you tonight. God's power through Jesus Christ and the grace of God is able to remove sin, to give us a new life, and give us the strength in order to walk it. How many believe that? How many believe that the blood can redeem? How many believe that the blood can set free? I believe it. I know it. I know it to be true. So if he can do it, then it's up to us to honor grace by walking in it. By walking in it. And the same things that the world has thrown out for years and years, the devil, he doesn't change his tricks. <laughs> the devil, hes a, I call him a three-trick pony. It's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He's used them for generation upon generation, and he still gets us. Why? Because it looks good. It looks good. It feels good. feels good. I can tell you right now, I'm, a, I, I'm, a, I'm ashamed of the life I live, but I'll be honest and truthful for you. When you get buzzed on whatever it is, it feels good. It's why people do it. It makes this flesh feel good. Well, certainly God wants me to feel good. Not that way. Not that way. How do I know that? It's right here in the Word. It's right here in the Word. Pastor Kirk didn't make it up. The Church of God didn't make it up. It's here in the Word. It's thus saith the Lord. God gave us this as a map on how to live our life. And if we choose to disobey it, then we're in sin. Plain and simple, gang. Plain and simple. But if we choose to honor it, and we say, you know what, God? I will honor that. And I'm not going to be involved in this stuff. I'm not going to be involved in this craziness. But this is what keeps you away from it. 
How do I stay away from sin? How do I stay away from those evil desires? Listen to what he says in verse 14. He says, instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we get into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? Many, many ways. Prayer, worship, whatever. Simply inviting him in. It's amazing to me how, and, and I know I've got to hurry, but it's amazing to me how, and I've said this before, that people don't want to do sin around me because I'm a preacher. And think about how it would change your day if next Sunday after church I came to your house and just hung out. From, from the time you got it until th- you went to bed, what would change in your course of your day? What would change? Would you be like, well, I'm not going to watch that because the pastor is going to be here and I don't want him to know that I watch that. Guys, I'm not the one judging you. I'm not the one who's letting you in or out of heaven. I'm not him. I'm not, I'm not, I'm trying to get there the same way you're trying to get there. But isn't it funny how our attitudes and our actions change when we think that someone that might have a bearing on that is around us. Think about how it would change your life if you realize that Christ is everywhere you go. When you sit down, he's there. When you're watching TV, he's there. When you're at work, he's there. Amen. When you're all by yourself and nobody knows what you're doing and you're there and it's just you, guess who's there? The Lord. Amen. The reason why this is so important to understand is because just by accepting the fact that Jesus is here, he's among us, he's within us, he's our present companion, he'll never leave us, never forsake us, it helps us to stay in check of, should I really be doing this? Should I really be doing this? Should I really be involved in this? Because if physically, in the physical form, Jesus stood before you, what would it change? You'd be like, wait a minute. That's not just pastor, that's the Lord right there. I don't think I would be saying this. I don't think I'd be doing this. Why? If that's the case, we need to try our best to yield sacrifice, become that living sacrifice to do that. Now, is that easy? No. Does it take practice? Yes. The Bible even says it does. The Bible says forever that we yielded our members to unrighteousness. That means we taught ourselves how to be good at sinning. When I was a sinner, I could drink, man. I could pour them down. On my 21st birthday, I did 21 shots of Jim or of Jack Daniels. 21. And kept on drinking. I knew how to drink. I trained myself how to drink. I knew how to do it. When I became saved, you know what I had to train myself to do? How to rely on the Lord. How to pray. How to seek His face. I yielded myself to things of righteousness instead of things of unrighteousness. And there's training. And that's in the Word of God. The Bible says now that you're apart from that life, you got to yield your members. If you're reading the, the King James, it says yield your members to things of righteousness. Which means you've got to train yourself how to defend yourself against the devil. And that's by getting into the Lord. And, I, and, and people can do it many ways. I don't want to put you in the little box and say you got to do it through prayer or reading or worship. you got to connect with God. However you do that, that's what you have to do. You've got to connect with God. Okay? He goes on. Let's keep on going here. In verse or chapter 14, verse 1. Accept other believers who are weak in the faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servant? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help they will stand and receive his approval. Now, what he's talking about, about eating, he refers it to eating, and we'll break it down to how it applies to us. In that day, there was many, many sacrifices to a lot of different idols. And once they would sacrifice, not the not the... The Israel sacrifice. The Israel sacrifice, the priest kept. Whatever they did, if they brought up a lamb, if they brought up a bull, whatever, whatever was left after the burning of the sacrifice, the priest kept for themselves, and they ate it. It was for them. That's in the Bible. The Bible told them they could do that because that was the Levite's heritage. 
They were servants unto the Lord. They didn't get any land in the children of Israel. They were the Levites. The God, God said, you know what? When the altering's up and the burning's there, what's left on there, you take a portion of it and you eat. That's what they did. Other gods who were worshipped, it wasn't that way. They would come, they would offer their whatever it was, their sacrifices. Then they would take that meat and they would sell it. They would put it on the market to sell, to make money. You know what? Everybody here likes, everybody likes steak? Like steak? That's what a bullock was. When they come and they offered a big bullock, that's a lot of steak. That's a lot of meat. And a lot of people said, man, that's, that's some good eating there. I want to eat that. Gentiles especially. Go to the market and eat it. Well, the Jews had a very big problem with this. Because they said, we don't want to eat anything that has been sacrificed to a false god. We don't want to eat anything that's been sacrificed to an idol. Or they didn't want to eat anything that was pork. If it was an unclean animal, they were like, no, we don't touch it. We don't want any of that. No pork chops, no bacon, none of that. They didn't want any of it because they felt it was unclean. But since grace came to the Gentiles and God opened it up, the Gentiles all of a sudden brought a new way of living. And to the Gentiles, eating a pork chop was natural. Eating bacon was natural. You know what? Hey, we're going to eat lobster, stuff like that. Couldn't eat that. Wasn't kosher. You couldn't eat anything any fish, if it didn't have scales, it has smooth skin or whatever, you, sorry, unclean, can't eat it. All it had to have scales. So understand, there's a lot of stuff that people were like, well, hey, this is good to eat. That the Jews are like, no, 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 you can't eat that. And what, what Paul is telling them, he's saying, listen, guys, just because you Gentiles understand, since the message came to Peter and Cornelius, where God put all the animals on a blanket, all of them were unclean. And he told Peter, he said, rise up and eat. And Peter's like, no, Lord. He did it three times. God was illustrating to them that he said, don't call unclean what I have called clean. And he was talking about the Gentile people. He's talking about he's bringing us in where forever we were considered unclean. But ever since that moment, kind of revelation hit that, you know what? If God told me to rise up and eat, it must be okay to eat this and be okay. Well, some Jews accepted it. Some Jews didn't. And the Jews that didn't would always want to argue with the Jews that did. And they would want to have religious debate. You can't eat that pork chop. That's unclean. If you eat that, you're a sinner against God. And the other guy was saying, no, no, no. God has cleaned it. God has called it good. Now we can eat it. It's okay. And the other one's like, no, no. And one's saying, you're bullheaded. The other one's saying, you're a sinner. This gets the cause of Christ nowhere. Nowhere. So what does God do? He gives this revelation to Paul. He says, you know what, guys? Don't argue about little things that don't really matter. <laughs> don't argue about things if one person has it. And what he's really talking about is personal conviction. Let me put it that way. Personal conviction. There's personal conviction out there. There's sin that is universal. That's wrong. We just went over it in the previous verse. God said, this is what they do. Don't do that. Put those dirty deeds away. But then there are other things that are convicting that we say, I had a, I pastored a woman, um, and she always cracked me up because she'd always go around and tell everybody that she's like, I was delivered from Coke. That's what she said. And I mean, she was an older lady. She wasn't talking about Coke, cane, cocaine. She was talking about the drink, caffeine, Coke. And she'd go around, and, and I remember because it was funny because we had a man in our church who was delivered from cocaine. He was a cokehead. And one day he was standing up and talking about his testimony. And he said, you know what? God delivered me from cocaine. And she chimed in and said, God delivered me from coke. And he was like, you were on cocaine? And she was like, no. She was like, what are you talking about? She was talking about soda. Now, how many of you drank a soda? Right? Right? Now, given this premise, what was happening is, if she was here among us right now, and all of you raised your hand, she'd be like, all you need to get delivered right now. All you people that, that, that you need to get delivered. Why? Because God delivered me from it. There's nothing wrong with Coke, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper. There's nothing wrong with it. You don't go to hell for drinking a soda. Understand? But she, something God did for her, because either she had a desire for it or God knew something along the lines that was going to hurt her, she, he gave her ability to lay that down. That doesn't mean everybody else has to submit to that. Do you understand? And it would be futile for us to argue whether Coke is good or not. Can we drink this? Can we drink that? Understand, 
God has bigger fish to fry than that. And the reason why a lot of, the, of denominations and church people are divided today, it's not about whether sin is right or wrong. It's about the little things that we don't see eye to eye on, that we debate each other on, and we just can't let go. And say, you know what? Do what Paul said. I'm not going to openly offend them. I'm not going to offend them for the sake of offending them. If I invite somebody over to my house, if there's a Jewish family that ever starts coming to Northgate and they don't believe pork is good, I'm not going to invite them over and give them a pork chop. I'm not going to do that. Why? Because that's going to offend them. I'll serve lamb. I'll serve something that's kosher. I'll make sure it's kosher. Why? Because I don't want to offend them. Not because I feel guilty for when I eat pork. I don't want to offend them. I don't want to cause them to stumble in their belief. Amen? This is what he's getting at. He says... He goes on. He says in verse 5, and boy, man, i got to quit. He says, In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while other thinks every day is alike. You should each uh, be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor Him. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. If we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to the Lord both of the living and of the dead. We'll quit right there. Or let, let me go ahead and read verse 10. He says, So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. What he's saying here, how many of you have heard, and, and I know it's a lot of well in, in, in America because I've people have asked me, how many of you have heard of people saying, you know what, the true Sabbath is on Saturday, not on Sunday. We got together and we changed that. The true Sabbath is on Saturday. How many of you have heard that before? How many of you ever argued with someone about that before? I have. <laughs> I'm being honest, I have. Because they're like, this, you know, this is not the Sabbath. You need to have church on Saturday, not Sunday or whatever. And... And you know what I told him? This. I said, you know what? The Bible says it doesn't matter. If you want to worship on the Sabbath and you call that Saturday, go for it. Because he's God of Saturday too. I'm going to go on Sunday because he's the God of Sunday too. And whatever day we pick to honor God, hey, do it. Some churches don't have church on Wednesday night. They have it on Tuesday night or they have it on Thursday night. They're not wrong for what they're doing. Some people have church on Saturdays, not Sundays. They're not wrong. It doesn't matter. This is not a salvation issue. This is not something we need to debate or look down on one another and have a fight over and say, no, you got it wrong. No, you got it wrong. It doesn't matter. All that matters is God is getting the glory. People are entering into their Sabbath and they are honoring God however they choose. Some people, I remember we had friends and, and uh, in, my, in Dad's, uh, Pinsburg, Pinsburg um, they didn't eat anything after dark. Well, I can't remember what they were. Um, but that was their belief. Seventh-day Adventists. But they would come to our church, but, and, and, and they enjoyed the church. They helped out. They worshiped. They did everything. But they said, you know what? Sundown, prior to the Sabbath, their Sabbath, they couldn't eat. Once there's something down, you couldn't eat, you couldn't do anything, it was a time of rest or whatever. To me, I thought it was weird. I was a high school kid and I was thinking, this is crazy. So what? The sun went down. Eat. You know, big deal. You know what? It doesn't matter. But to them it mattered. But see, I was young and naive and didn't understand the word. But now I look back on it and say, you know what? By them doing that, I didn't do it. God didn't require me to do it. By them doing it, they honored God by doing that. I honored God by getting up, going to church Sunday. The way we honor God, God doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to God how we honor God. It just matters that we do honor God. So don't get caught up in the little things that don't matter. Okay? Let's quit because I'm, I'm going way too long. We'll pick up next week uh, right there.